Welcome to Building the Future, hosted by Kevin Horick. With millions of listeners a month, Building the Future has quickly become one of the fastest rising programs with a focus on interviewing startups, entrepreneurs, investors, CEOs, and more. The radio and TV show airs in 15 markets across the globe, including Silicon Valley. For full show times, past episodes, or to sponsor the show, please visit buildingthefutureshow.com. Welcome back to the show. Today we have Jeremy Hans. He's a journalist and writer. Jeremy, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, I'm excited to have you on the show. I think what we're going to cover today with you is very, very important. I think a lot of people have been struggling with it for, well, a large part of their life. And I think with the pandemic and everything that's happening, it's probably gotten a lot worse for some people. It's maybe just started happening to some people, but maybe before we get into all that, let's get to know you a little bit better and start off with where you grew up. Sure. So I grew up in a, a small, like farming community, small town um, okay. called Buffalo, Minnesota. Um, but it was just about an hour's drive away from the Twin Cities. So that's St. Paul, Minneapolis. Um, so I grew up in, you know, uh, in a farming family, like hobby farming. Uh, in woods and nature and with 40 acres. But then I was able, you know, as I got older and became a teenager, you know, there's a lot of opportunities in the Twin Cities, which is where I currently live. I live in St. Paul. Got you. So you went to college. What did you take and why? So I was, um, <clears throat> I've always loved books. I've always loved writing and I've always loved stories. So I ended up uh, in in my bachelor's degree. I did the classic sort of English major <laughs> with with like, no plan as to what I would do as a career. Um, absolutely no idea, you know, but just wanted to like read great books basically. And then uh, I, d I ended up doing, taking a few, you know, number of years off, kind of did a bunch of odd jobs. And then I went back to uh, graduate school and actually did a great books program out in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Uh, and that's at St. John's. And uh, where you literally just sit around and read like the Greeks and the Romans and the, you know, uh, medieval period and, and sort of all the dead white dudes uh, and, and talk about it. And it was a, a really incredible program. Um, but from that was during the time when I started to uh, get into journalism, which I had not expected to do, but which sort of presented itself as an opportunity. And I jumped on it and I've been doing uh, really journalism and writing ever since. Okay. So what made you make the jump to journalism and what got you passionate about it? So along with being loving stories and novels and, and writing and everything, I, I've always loved the natural world. I think growing up on a, on a farm, uh, I had a, a grandfather who started the Minnesota Landscape Arboretum. So he was obsessed with plants and flowers and things. And I think it's just in my blood that I just, I'm really uh, just love being out in nature and discovering new things. Um, and, and, you know, as I got a little older, some of that kind of drifted away and I, and I, and I focused on other things, but um my fiance, uh, my then fiance, now wife, and I ended up doing a trip to the Peruvian Amazon when we were in our early 20s. And that really uh, awakened for me, again, this sort of obsession with animals and nature. And that led to me sort of using some of my writing skills to do a couple op-eds. And eventually, I just sort of got this sort of informal internship at um, Manga Bay, which is an environmental news website. And even though I didn't have a journalism background, I basically just kind of learned by trial and error, learned on the job, learned uh, from editing and, and 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 people there, and then eventually just got a full-time position there and have been kind of going ever since. So it wasn't like it was a plan. It was more that I was just lucky <laughs> to be there at the right time in the right moment um, and, and have, you know, developed as a writer and grew as a writer and learned um, sort of everything about journalism that I could uh, in order to to sort of do what I do today, which is more freelance journalism. Very cool. So you recently wrote a book. What's the book called and what is it about and what made you actually decide to write it? The book is called Baggage, um, Confessions of a Globetrotting Hypochondriac. And the book is the story of uh, trips I've taken over the last uh, about 18 years, um, most of them for my environmental journalism. But it comes with the twist that uh, I have OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder, and I've also um, struggled with anxiety and depression. And so I am a 
terrible, ludicrous traveler. Like I'm ridiculous. I have panic attacks all the time. I I hate planes. I hate cars. I hate any kind of transportation. And so the book is sort of a humorous look at that, but also a you know I, I don't shy away from sort of the the more intense, more uh, darker moments of what it's like to live with chronic mental illness. Um, and so it was sort of a, an attempt to kind of blend both those, you know, funny travel stories. And there's a lot of humor with, you know, talking about mental illness, talking about the natural world as I've sort of experienced it and sharing those stories and blending those themes together and creating sort of a, a memoir of travel, if you will. Interesting. So walk us through some of the stuff you talk about in the book, because I think with the pandemic, I think a lot of people are experiencing some sort of variation of kind of their dealing with their own mental health. Right. Yeah. And oh, yeah. obviously I think some is just like a small amount and some is kind of very severe and everywhere in between. Yes. I, I think, I think this is like a, a perfect time uh, to sh shed a light highlight um, mental health and mental illness in general, because, you know, people who have been struggling with mental illness are probably experiencing it in new and often worse ways, unfortunately, over the last 12 months. I know I have. Sure. Um, and people who have never struggled with mental illness are really feeling that pressure and maybe struggling with it for the first time, which, you know, coming head to head with mental illness for the first time is, is absolutely terrifying. Um, so I was somewhat lucky in many ways. Like I was diagnosed with uh, anxiety and depression when I was 10. Okay. So it, that sounds, I mean, it should sound somewhat unlucky, but really for my life's journey, I got diagnosed early and kind of learned, uh, you know, tools and ways to live with it from a young age. And I had a family that was incredibly supportive, which I would not, you know, have, have been able to do that if not for that. Um, I was diagnosed, I wasn't diagnosed with OCD until in my twenties. And that was after the Peru trip. Um, and so I've, I've, you know, just learned a lot of strategies over the last 30 years, really, of, of how to kind of live with my own personal chronic mental illness. And, you know, everyone's mental illness is different. Everyone's severity level is different. So it's always a difficult to talk in complete generalities. But there are, there are certain themes, I think, that come through of, of taking care of yourself, of, you know, sometimes uh, medication is required. Often therapy is, I found therapy to be, especially with the right therapist, to be hugely important. Um, and then other things that you might not think of as much like meditation, yoga, exercise. Uh, for me, being out in nature, as I said, can be really good for my mental health. Uh, reading a book, you know, doing those kind of self-care things, whatever it is that sort of brings you uh, uh, that spark of joy or a spark of um uh, calmness in this sort of weird, uh, really marathon that we're all running uh, of this of this COVID nineteen pandemic, where our lives have been upended uh, so much. So I think you know it is a really important time to signal out that you know mental illness is is you know I I kind of hate to use this word, but it's kind of normal. You know uh, the research shows that a good percentage of people experience it at some point in their life. Um, whether that be a, a period of depression or some some certain types of anxiety stuff. And for those of us who have chronic mental illness, which is like, you know, we kind of struggle with it on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, it's so important to develop habits that can allow you to, to you know, do the things that you want to do, function at your your best level and, and you know, continue to move forward. Um, and so that's, that's you know, th there's that, that theme is throughout the book. I mean, the book really sort of goes through my mental health journey and sort of how I eventually get to the point where, you know, I am doing these trips, even though they're difficult. Um, I am doing these trips, even though they make my mental health go <laughs> all the pieces and I have to do all these things to kind of mitigate that. But it, it matters enough to me and I want to do it enough that I kind of keep doing it. Um, and I think in some ways that's a that's a small metaphor for like what we're all doing right now, which is like we're all, I think, struggling in our own personal ways. And we're all trying to do that every day. Um, and just finding the resilience and and the healthy habits that we can use to sort of keep ourselves up and, and help others where we can um, is it, so important right now. No, I 100% agree. So maybe I'm, I'm curious to get your thoughts on, is there basic signs or symptoms that people should 
look out for in themselves so they can recognize it? Because I think sometimes people are, are dealing with something, but they don't fully recognize what it is or, or what they're feeling, or maybe they're trying to just like push that feeling away because they oh it's uncomfortable and they don't want to deal with it. But is, is there things that you can mention to people or, or what are your thoughts around that? Yeah, no, I think that's, a, that's such an important question because like, for example, when I had, when I was finally diagnosed with OCD, clearly looking back, I'd been dealing with that for years, but all the therapists I saw and psychiatrists, they, they didn't catch it. Um, and uh, I thought I was acting rationally, but my fiance was like, you're, you know, you're bonkers, dude. Like the things <laughs> you're saying are completely irrational. You're having panic attacks over like a stray dog, you know, wanting attention from you. Like I was acting, and that's a, sort of a story that I tell throughout the first chapters of the book is how, you know, how irrational I was acting. But in my brain, I thought I was acting completely rationally. Um, and so mental illness can be really deceptive in that way. And, and, and I think, you know, there are signs obviously to look for. I think one of the important things is to have open communication with the people that you love and are living with, or, or if you're alone, make sure you're talking to people every day on Zoom or, at, you know, if you're going into work or something and, and, and get it, you know, be, be open enough to ask like, Hey, you know, I've been having these thoughts. Do you think, you know, you know, find someone that you can talk to about it. Even, you know, if it's not a therapist right away, you're just kind of trying to get a sense. The other thing is there's so much good resources online now which you know was not available when i was a kid like that you can look up okay what are some of the symptoms like you know depression can be just like you're sleeping a lot you're you're you just have less energy you're just you're you kind of don't care about anything all of a sudden like those are some signs that we don't always think of you know we think of depression as like melancholy and like despair and you know totally yeah yeah and it can be much more mild than that but if that goes on for weeks and weeks and weeks like that can be really difficult um so that can be signs of, you know, of, of, of depression, you know, anxiety can be, can be different. OCD can be different. All these different things have different symptoms, but I think it's important, especially now when we're all living a different life than we were even a year ago with, with new stresses and challenges and new responsibilities that just to kind of check in with yourself, check in with loved ones. And if you think you might be struggling with something, like I would say instantly try and, you know, make an appointment with a therapist. Uh, the therapists are doing all their calls, you know, over zoom now, over the phone, whatever you need. And there's a lot of great ones out there. And they're really, obviously they've been, they're really on key with what's going on with COVID right now and how it's making people struggle. So getting in to see a therapist or even your general practitioner over zoom and just asking them some questions, they can do a real quick evaluation that can give you a sense of, Oh, you know, here's kind of where you're sitting, you know, here's, here's maybe what we can do about it. Um, and so I think turning to a doctor and an expert uh, is is a really good thing if you're if you're starting to get concerned. But obviously, you know, open communication with with others I think is a good way. Other people can often see things that you might not notice. Like you say, sometimes it's really deceptive. So other people, you know, ask them, you know, you know, uh, is you know, I've been feeling really down or really low. Like, you know, do you feel like this is enough for me to like talk to someone? Uh, uh, you know, talk to a doctor? Or do you think that this is just kind of a norm with being in the winter and COVID times, you know, and those are things. And, you know, if you're having any thoughts about that get really dark uh, or, or suicidal, obviously that is a time to turn to help immediately. Um, you don't want to just sit on that uh, because that is uh, not something you should a have to suffer through and, and obviously can be something that can be very dangerous. Sure. S but how do you, how did you get, or what do you recommend to people to get the courage to actually talk to somebody or even mention it to somebody. Cause I think it's, it seems, it sounds so simple, but it's probably yeah. one of the most difficult things to do. Right. Yeah. It is such a vulnerable thing. And it's, it's interesting because, uh, you know, I, I, again, I was diagnosed when I was 10, I was put in therapy by my parents, but I, I hit it and I still hide it all the time. People with chronic mental illness, we become the best actors <laughs> because we're sure. so used to being able to go out in public or go to work or go, you know, whatever we do and be able to not show that, that part of ourselves. Um, and so you learn many different measures to sort of hide it from people. Uh, but it is such a vulnerable thing to do. And that's why what's number one is so important is to choose the right person. If you don't have a person in your life that you feel like you can have that candid conversation with and talk about these things, talk about your deeper emotions, talk about some of your fears, then I would say go to a doctor, go to a therapist. They okay. are trained in this. They they you know know how to do this. But 
you know, if, if you have a parent or a sibling or a friend or a coworker who's maybe struggled as well, like often it's about finding the right person and just having that kind of quick conversation, like, hey, you know, um, and 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 I think one of the things I've learned in writing this book, I was terrified of writing this book, and I it was not like a, a book that I like was like, yay, let's write this. It was because I, I put myself out there, it's very vulnerable. I talk about things that I've only really talked about with therapists and my wife, you know? Sure. Um, and so, but one of the things I've discovered obviously is putting out the book and I, and I kind of, you know, you, you kind of know this might happen, but is that I have a lot of people coming to me saying, you know, this is really helpful. I've been there. I've struggled with these things too. You know, when I, you know, when, when we hunt out and back in the day, I wish we had talked about it. You know what I mean? You get those kind of things where it's like, and you do realize that, a lot of people have struggled mental illness or know someone who has, you know, has sure. a loved one who has. So I think it's more prevalent than, than we think. The other thing is, you know, obviously there are people that I would not recommend talking about. There are still people who are basically, I would say mental health deniers to a certain extent um, or just don't understand it because they've never experienced it or never had a loved one. And, you know, that's not someone to reach out to right now. You know, if you're struggling, like you want to reach out to someone to either expertise or someone that you just know, is going to be compassionate, is going to listen, and and maybe even has some of their own personal experiences with it. I think that's always a good sign. Um, you know, if you reach out with someone and the conversation doesn't go the way you hoped, it doesn't go very well, then I would say, you know, yeah, it's time then maybe to talk to your your general doctor, if you you know, or, or make an appointment with a therapist or something like that. Um, there are also, obviously, there's lots of uh, resources online. There are, there are places where you can call and you can talk to someone immediately. Um, so those are always good resources if you're feeling like you're in crisis. Um, so I, I would definitely recommend that again, if you're at a level where you're like, oh no, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to wait until my friend is available for a long conversation. Like if you're feeling like you're in crisis, reach out and get some help. And those people are trained, uh, to, to, to deal with whatever issues you're, you're, you know, you need to just sort of talk to another human about. Sure. And the, the you mentioned it quickly earlier, but and it's something I've struggled with too, is like just trying to make time to take care of myself, whatever yeah. that means. Oh, yeah. Right. And like, it, it's just been recently, to be honest with you, that I kind of started working out. I've been awful at working out mm -hmm. my whole kind of life. Well, I played sports as a kid, but I, you know, in my adult life, I've sure. struggled with, you know, getting into some sort of routine and I've been kind of trying for the last couple months and it's going well ish and like but it's like it's an ongoing battle and i think a lot of people are struggling with something as simple as just getting into a routine or taking 20 minutes 30 minutes a few times a week maybe an hour out of the week a couple two three times a week to just like do something for yourself whether it's work out meditate a bit of both go for a walk whatever you the, the list yeah. can be endless right but it's just trying to figure out what works for you and doesn't work for you. And like, I'll give you a really stupid example for me that worked is like, I've tried to work out. I've tried DVDs. I've tried online stuff. I've tried a bunch of gizmos and gadgets and mm -hmm. whatever else bought a bunch of crap over the years that I have used a handful of times and it's collecting dust. And like the, the one thing that I, I've got an Apple watch finally and just like the activity rings on that thing. And I always joke that it's like my little digital overlord, but like just <laughs> that constant reminder of like, Hey, you can do this. You should get up and walk around or, you know, you have like 10 minutes left and you can meet your like rings. And I didn't really realize that I needed those like in your face reminders to kind of yeah. motivate me. And I'm not saying go buy an Apple watch. Cause like I, who knows if that's going to work for you yeah. or not, but for me, it's been working, right? And I've tried yeah. everything else, but it's like you just can't give up until you find the thing that motivates you and and gets you to be kind of healthier and just take time out of your day for yourself. Do you agree? Yeah. Or what are your thoughts on that? No, I think I think that's that's really important. And I think you know your story highlights just that sometimes you just have to experiment, experiment, experiment until you find what works for you. And and we're all so different, and we're motivated by different things that like something that might work for you might might not work for someone else right sure. and like, i think you know part of it is i have to constantly remind myself uh we are in the middle of a global pandemic the likes of which we have not seen in over 100 years 
Sure. Uh, so part of it is, first of all, just having some kindness for yourself. You know, if, if I go, you know, a couple days and don't do my yoga routines or don't do a meditation, like that's okay. <laughs> you know, like yep. we're all just trying to freaking get by. Um, on the other hand, you know, you, you do have to be purposeful about, you know, finding that time. And, and like you said, you know, it can be anything. It can be playing video games if that's what gives you some peace and some joy, like totally. whatever works for you. You know, it can be going for a walk. It can be, you know, I mean, obviously for mental health struggles, like especially in the winter, like exercise can be so important. I've, I find it's really important for me to get those endorphins going and just to get a break. Um, but it just it's so different for everybody. But I think I think part, you know, when we're all sort of stuck inside uh, is, you know, some of us are struggling with being lonely because we have, we're in our apartment or house all by ourselves and others are struggling with just being constantly around our family. And so it's just important to find whatever you can carve out a little time every day or every couple days to say, okay, I'm going to do this thing that I enjoy or do this thing that I enjoy or get out and get a walk or, you know, like you know, uh, read a book or do this. And it's just about trying to making that a priority is kind of what it ends up being. Right. And whether that, you know, means you need to put a reminder on your phone, uh, or that means you need to like uh, make a date for a, a distance walk with a friend, like whatever you kind of need to do to do that. It, it, it's just so important right now to, to even when if you don't struggle with mental health, right? Like even if you've never struggled with it, to find a little self care here and there um, is is so vital right now. I think just to to keep our spirits up as we sort of you know enter into this new year, and so I think it's really just being mindful about it, right, and making it a priority. But at the same time, you know, if you miss it a day or two, don't don't beat yourself up. You know, what I mean, let yourself be OK with that and then just just say, OK, well, you know, I can get to it tomorrow. But being purposeful and mindful and making that a priority, I think that's the only way to make that happen. And we live, you know, we live in an age and a world where we're constantly bombarded by media, where we're, we're all working more than we should. We're sleeping less than we should. So we just, you know, uh, we <laughs> we got to find ways to sort of find that that balance. Um, to take care of ourselves, because the thing is, if you don't take care of yourself, you're going to get to a point where you can't take care of anybody else, um, and that is when things get real toxic, you know. Um, so that that's that's my suggestion. It's kind of amorphous, I know, but it, we're all so different. We need different things. So, but I think just making that a mindful priority is is your best way to start. No, I hundred percent agree. It's interesting because I I think and I'm almost thirty eight and it took me this long to really start caring about kind of my own self care and, and going through and trying to take my own time. Like I've kind of half-assed it at best over the last decade or so. And it, it's just, it's, I guess as you get older, you kind of appreciate it more. Right. And you're like, Oh, I really need to do something because I can't, this can't last forever. And I know yeah. people figured it out like a lot earlier than I sure did. Right. And I think yeah. the, the thing that I'm trying to get out across is like, no matter how far or beginning, or if you've been doing it forever, it's like staying in it is challenging, no matter whether it's day two or it's day, like, you know, it's, you've been doing it for 10 years. It's hard to stay motivated and at it. And like, care for yourself especially during this time because some people it seems like everybody i talk to is either super busy or completely dead right now and like yeah, sure right. there's some people in the middle but it's it's like when you're super super busy whether it's pre or post covid it's just trying to still cut out that time for yourself but and then if you're on the other side like if you have a lot of time right now like probably no better time than to at least start to do stuff you enjoy that will help you become a happier, healthier person. Yeah, I, I think that's so true. And like, you know, the weird thing about COVID is it's, it's, it's been an awful global tragedy, but it's also opened up these sort of these possibilities for some people of like, sure, oh, maybe I'll try this or maybe, you know, and I think like a, just a, a, an example for myself, like one of the things I love to do most is, is go swimming, you know, okay. just being in the water, floating, swimming that's one of the ways i used to especially in the winter get my exercise and you know now i have to be more creative about okay well <laughs> what am i going to replace that with you know sure. um and and so that's just kind of what we all have to do if there's things that you love to do whether it's like going out to eat going to the movie theater going swimming like 
find some way, something else that you can do safely, you know, that you can do that you can kind of replace that with. And again, just make that sort of a priority. And, and, you know, one of the things about, you know, understanding how habits are formed is that they take a long time to form, you know, they take a long time to become strong. I, I don't remember exactly what it is. I think it's like 90 days or more or something to, before you like it, it starts to feel a little easier. Um, and so, so just, you know, be kind to yourself, try it, know that it's going to be hard, know that it's going to take a while, but know that like there, there is benefit in, in developing a habit around just giving yourself, you know, a half hour of time every day or whatever to do something that brings you joy and comfort. Um, and that, that is okay. Like that is part of being human, right? Like we need to, we can't be bombarded all the time with stress and chaos and worry. Um, nobody can withstand that, uh, 24 seven, you have to take some time out, um, and do what you need to do and, and trying something new. You know, if you've never tried meditation, try it. You know, if you've never done yoga, try it. If you've never done weightlifting, you know, give it a go, like just try something else. And if it doesn't work, who cares, throw it away and, and try something else. You know what I mean? Try baking totally. bread, you know, like it, th there's, there's a certain level of creativity here and a certain chance for us to do something different. And, you know, one of the things that has been so fascinating is, is watching people sort of rediscover nature, um, you know, going out on walks, rediscovering uh, just, just even neighborhood little green spaces. I have friends who are like, oh my God, I never knew this park was nearby. And, you know, and, and myself too, I've been spending more time in nature because it's something that you can do relatively safely with COVID. Um, and you can, you know, go try bird watching for your first time or just go for a walk in a park. You know, those are things that we can, we can do, um, in, in the meantime, and maybe develop a, a love and an interest in that, or maybe not, you know, but it's, it's worth a shot. Totally. The other thing that I found that I've done, um, kind of on and off, but I've been kind of doing it the last few months is turn off notifications for things that I've deemed distracting. And for example, like I don't, I turned off all my notifications for like social media. I've been even deleted some of the social media apps from my phone. I turned off my email notifications. Like I can still go to my email app and check email, but it's for me, it's now it's like, I choose to check my email instead of like yeah. getting a notification to, to actually answer that email. And that being said, I'm on the computer all the time and I haven't turned my notifications off from my computer. So it's like, if I'm not on my computer, I'm checking email when I choose to check email. And I'm not saying you need to, everybody needs to do that. It's just sure. one of those things that I've found to be useful for me. That's worked yeah. really well. It's just like, I'll check social media when I choose to check social media. I'll check my email if I'm not on my computer when I choose to check email, right? Like yeah. um, little, little tweaks like that, I think help you get the ball rolling. And you say like, today I'm going to turn off my social media notifications tomorrow or in two weeks, I'm going to see how that's going. And if I like that, I'm going to turn off my email notifications. And then a week or two or three days later, it's like, I'm going to go for a walk because I don't do that normally or like whatever, right? But you keep yeah. adding these like, little changes to your life because it, it's really hard to say i'm going to delete all my social media apps delete, yeah, check right. my email i'm going to start yeah. running i'm going to walk i'm going to exercise yeah. i'm going to like it's just so overwhelming you're never going to do that right it's like no. little and you're, steps. Setting, you're setting yourself up for failure if totally. you, you know you have to do it in steps and you have to start with you know like that's yeah I, and I think that's a great idea. I think, I think that, I mean, I, I do that too. Like I don't have any notifications on my phone. Uh, and it's kind of like taking the power back, right? Totally. You make the decision when you do it. And the thing about like, I, as a journalist, I have to be on social media and stuff, but like social media rarely brings happiness, right? Totally. It rarely brings uh, relaxation or comfort. And, you know, our human brains were never really meant to be taking in as much information as we take in. Uh, and, and so I'm all for like finding kind of, I guess you could call it healthy habits or, or good habits around social media and email where like, I mean, I, I took kind of a month off from social media cause I just got so burnt out, uh, right, right around the election that I just couldn't, I couldn't sure. do it anymore. Um, and so, and I knew that about myself and, you know, I have a therapist who's always like social media is, you know, you really be careful about how much time. Cause like it's a time suck and it it doesn't help your mood or make you feel much better about the world usually. Right. Yeah. Um, it doesn't mean it's, it's a great evil and you have to completely avoid it. Um, and, and obviously for many of us in our careers or our jobs, it's a necessity, but it does mean finding like, as you said, 
some ways to manage it so that it's not taking over every day of your day. And so that you're not sort of just getting, you know, getting stuck in, in Twitter arguments that go on and on. Like, what is the point of that? You know, how often does that actually change people's minds? Are there other ways you can use your time that are going to be, be better for you and better for the world? You know, and, and I think that that is something that we all need to, I think that's a, a perfectly valid thing to look at when you're looking at improving your mental health um, is, is looking at your own social media and, and, and maybe even just defending some people that, you know what, you don't need them in your life. Right. Um, totally. and, and so I think that's, that's, that's another just important step. And, and it's, you know, the, it is, a, it is, again, it doesn't, like you said, it doesn't have to be like banning yourself from all social media. It can be small things that can make a, a big difference. And then you can say, okay, well, let me evaluate that. Oh yeah, that I like that, but I'm going to change back to this kind of a thing. Right. Like totally. that's fine. Um, it's about experimenting and finding kind of what works for you on a personal level. Sure. So I want to talk about, cause you have obviously like a family, how do you communicate with your wife and, and family about how you're doing that day? Because obviously oh, sure. you're going to have good days, bad days, some days in the middle. Yes. How do you handle that and manage that with somebody significant in your life? So I, that's a, such a good question. So um, my wife and I met when I was 19 and she was 16. Okay. And um, so quite young, uh, we, we didn't start dating until a couple of years later. Um, but she's known me a long time. I'm 41 now. Um, okay. So I, and I was always, so the thing is, is like by that point, you know, I'd been struggling with mental health throughout all my teen years and stuff. So I was very open with her from when we got to know each other when I, you know, the interest was there that, you know, I struggle with these things. This is, you know, how it is. And she was very supportive. Um, and, you know, that was, that's part of a relationship test, right? Like if you're someone who struggles with chronic mental illness and you're certain you're dating someone who, who isn't supportive, that's not going to work. Right. Right. Uh, that, so we've known each other a long time, but I'm, yeah, I mean, I'm just honest. Like I just say like, okay, you know, honey, today's kind of a rough day. Uh, here's what I'm thinking I'm going to do. Or, the other thing is she knows me so well now. She can just tell by my face, my expression, or, or the way right. I'm speaking sometimes. She can be like, okay, Jeremy, you need to go take some time for yourself. Like, you need to go take a nap, or you need to go read, or you need to go, you know, she'll kind of, if I'm doing really bad, she'll sort of be the one that will push me to, to change my behavior and, and do something else. Um, my daughter is 10. She is uh, also, because she lives with me, she's well aware of, of the things that I deal with, obviously. Um, and you know, and I just am honest with her about, you know, dad's having a rough depression day today. He needs to take some time off. Why don't you do this or this or this, you know, uh, it's, it's all about communication and honesty. Um, and it, it, you know, again, that, that can be super vulnerable. I am sort of so used to it now that it's, it's not, it's not I'm not saying it's easy. Like there are days when I don't want to have to tell Tiffany, like I'm having right. a bad, you know, I don't want to have to be like, she's stressed out. She's, she's managing a lot more than I am. And I'm like, Oh, Tiffany, I'm, you know, <laughs> you know, um, but I still have to do it because otherwise our marriage and our relationship would, would suffer and, and, right. and you would suffer in the long run too. Right. So it's just, it, it really is about building that trust and honesty. And I have learned from her, she is incredibly supportive and an, and incredibly understanding, which is not obviously every person is that. So I, I've really lucked out and, you know, but part of that is that we've built that up over the years that she knows, you know, when I say this or that, that I'm not, you know, I'm not trying to get out of doing the dishes or, or being the on point parent at that moment. Like I really just need this or, you know, there will be consequences <laughs> down the road um, from my mental health. And so it is about communication. And then it's also about, I, I try as a partner, to really recognize how hard that can be for her at times. Right. Sure. The, the, my, my, my parents both struggled with mental illness. So as a child, I watched what, you know, how hard that can be on the spouse. So I just really try to acknowledge that all the time and be like, you know, I know, you know, and, and she is appreciative of that. But I think that that is important to be able to say like, you know, I know you love me. I, I know, you know, we're happy, but I also want to say like, I, I really understand that this, kind of is sucks sometimes that you have to like kind of drop everything and take over because I'm having a, a one of my days. Um, so, you know, it, it is, it is about building up that communication and, and, and being able to be that vulnerable with someone, but you know, any good relationship, whether that someone has mental illness or not is based on 
you know, the ability to communicate, the ability to be vulnerable with that person, the ability to be honest, all those things make for any good long lasting relationship. So it's not new, but it does take a sort of an extra level when you're dealing with someone who's mentally ill. Sure. Well, and I think even just all the stuff you outlined could be very much applied to a business partner or kind of your upper management, like just being brutally honest about how you're feeling and, and doing that day. And then also getting your business partner or, or your managers or whatever to tell you the same thing back. Like, like nothing's worse than if somebody's having a hard time and you know, you can help them, yeah. but you can't help them because you don't know that they need help because they can't tell you. Right. And yeah. I get yeah. that's easier said than done, but you can work on that relationship. And I think even just asking somebody as simple as like, how are you doing today? Like, things are kind of sucky right now in the world. Like, yeah. tell me how you're doing. Like, I understand if you're not as productive this week or this year because of, you know, COVID or, or whatever that and yeah. something else. Right. Just being like brutally honest with people and saying, you know, like I had a shitty day too last yesterday. Right. Yeah. And I didn't do much because I just, I don't know. Like it just was something that, just was not motivated or I was freaked out because of X, Y, and Z. Right. Yeah. And it's been, it's, I mean, I've heard some stories about companies, you know, doing that more, checking in more often, uh, saying that they're, you know, understanding that that productivity might be down during these times. Uh, and that, that is totally okay. And if you need to take them, you know, and I think that that is so important for companies to, you know, if you want employees that respect you, that, uh, feel like they have some stake in the game. You have to be understanding of, you know, that this year is very different, but also of, yeah, I mean, it's, you, you know, I, I've, I've told employers before and had mixed results, but like some of them have been incredibly supportive when I've, you know, I've had, I've had times when I needed to take basically two weeks off of work of kind of an unpaid or paid leave because of my mental health at the time. And, you know, incredibly supportive, you know? And so I, th I think that that is an important thing that employers really should start thinking about and asking about more is, and just checking in with. And, you know, and I understand from a mental health, someone who struggles with mental health that like, you know, going to your employer and being like, look, these are the things I deal with, right? Can be, is really difficult. And I don't, and it depends on the employer as to whether or not that is maybe a good idea or how you want to approach that, you yeah. know? Um, but I do think it's, 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 it's in the empl employer's best interest to reach out to people and to say, hey, you know, it is okay if you need some extra time. It is okay, you know, and that that opens up a conversation, right? Because then the sort of the boss or the company is opening up a conversation about, you know, let me know if you need something, you know, let me know if you need some extra time, let me know. And that can maybe lead to a, a bigger conversation about, you know, hey, you know, this is what I struggle with. Can you just be aware of that? And I'll let you know if I need a couple extra days, you know, like, that's, that's really all it takes. Um, and I think that that is such an important thing uh, that we need to change in our culture is just being more honest about these realities. Um, because otherwise you just get people that are going to be burnt out and, and aren't going to be, you know, any, aren't going to be able to do the job in the long run anyway. Um, and, and we don't want that, you know? Sure. Well, and I also think too, th that like, the more honest you are and open and adaptive to your employees needs, you're going to recruit better talent and yeah. better talent are going to stay yes. because they know that they're taken care of and they're cared for. Yeah. Like nothing is worse or nothing demotivates employees more than when they feel like you care let you don't care about them at all Yeah. or very little. Right. Yeah. And yeah. I get that's really harsh to say, but I think the reality is, and, and COVID, I think one of the few pros that have come out of this is the employers that have kind of adapted and embraced the change of letting people work from home and not like grudgingly like tracked every minute and like making sure they're yeah. online yeah. nine to five, you know, Monday to Friday, like they'll sure they might not see the benefits of that today but i think in the long term and as things kind of get back to somewhat normal people will really appreciate that and stick around yeah. say you know what like my employer is awesome because yeah. they really sure it 
probably suck for them. Like some people like having people in the office, especially when you work your, you work hard and you know, you went from just you and now you have hundreds or tens of employees. It doesn't really matter. And then all of a sudden it's like, they're, it's just kind of gone. Right. And you're like, well, I don't really, this is uncomfortable. Like the fact that you've kind of adapted and allowed people a little bit extra freedom, I think will go a long way once kind of hopefully majority of the population's vac vaccinated and and things kind of get back to normal. Yeah, for sure. I think I think it shows it, it builds loyalty, right? It builds loyalty and it builds trust and all those things that I think have in many ways and in, in, in at least in, in American society have been sort of less valued uh, by companies and such in, in in the last few decades. And and I think that that has been not just a mistake for like bottom line, whatever, but like a mistake for just uh, the, the, the well-being of society and the well-being of your employees, like, right. Like, uh, having employees that feel like, you know, the company is looking out for them, cares about them, is doing what it can to like, you know, uh, adapt to, to their personal needs when things, if things are in a crisis, uh, for whatever reason, uh, those are the people that are going to stick around and, and really be passionate about their work. You know, as opposed to the other thing, which is like basically like someone who's scrolling around looking for what's the what's the how can I get out of this hellhole? What's the next job? You know, I can get. And so I think that that I think the companies that have responded more gracefully to this and with more um, flexibility, as you say, are the ones that are going to in the long term, you know, the the people who work there will want to stay there. Um, hopefully, you know, and, and, and there will be rewards for that. They might not be as tangible right away, as you say, but there will be, you know, rewards and. You know, it also is just recognizing that we're all human, you know, and we all yeah. have this is an incredibly stressful time. And, and you know, this year has been full of uh, just incredible challenges. Um, and, and, you know, if, if we kind of lose sight of that, then we're just we're going to jump into bad old bad habits that weren't really serving us very well to begin with. Um, and I do feel like if anything, you know, if we can take anything out of this pandemic, it's changing some of our behaviors and our relationships to each other, you know, viewing ourselves uh, more as a community that can lift each other up and, and help each other when we need help. And, and you know, you know, and, and less as sort of like everyone's competing against everyone else and everyone's got their shivs out ready to attack, you know, like it, that's that's not a healthy society and it's not sustainable in the long run. And so I think that this is a chance for us to find new ways of, of, of living and, and communicating with each other. No, I, I a hundred percent agree, but we're kind of coming to the end of the show. So how about we close with mentioning where people can get more information about yourself, the book and any other links you want to mention? Yeah. So, uh, you can go to my website, Jeremy Hans, that's H A N C E.com. Um, and you can find information on the, I mean, the book is basically available everywhere. Uh, it is also available in audiobook uh, done by a really great voice actor, award-winning voice actor, and people have been really happy with the audiobook. It's been great. Uh, it's on Kindle, of course, or any e-reader, and then of course there's a there's a paperback print edition. So you can go on my website if you find you know, or you can go anywhere where books are sold. Um, my website also has uh, more information about me and, and the kind of journalism that I do, the environmental journalism that I do. Um, but yeah, that's that's sort of where you can kind of keep up. Uh, on, on what I'm up to if you want or, if, or check out the book if that's something that you might find interesting or if you have a loved one who you know is, is struggling with mental health issues or if they know some you know if you have someone who knows someone with mental health issues it's, it's a, I think it's a good book for like understanding kind of the inner process of, of how uh, mental health uh, issues can work while still being funny and interesting and, and you know traveling around the world with me basically. Perfect. Well, I really appreciate you taking the time out of your day to be on the show, and I look forward to keeping in touch with you, and have a good rest of your day. Thank you, Kevin. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you. Okay, bye. Thanks for listening. Please visit our website at buildingthefutureshow.com to join the free community, sign up for our newsletter, or to sponsor the show. The music is done by Electric Mantra. You can check him out at electricmantra.com and keep building the future.